Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our first Suffer Faster show in the Discord on the Stage channel. Uh, I am John. I am the media guy. We're trying some stuff out. And uh, with me today, I'm just kind of emceeing this awesome panel. Uh, they did 70.3 Boulder, but uh, with me today is the Paragon Pro Squad, which is Becca, Mark, and Pablo. Say hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Sweet. So uh, before feel we famous, get, huh? what's that? I feel famous because yeah. I'm, in, I'm in a state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. yeah, there's like it's it's all branding, right? I mean, that's like my job. It's like, oh, it's a stage channel. Suddenly, everything <laughs> is. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so before we get started, um, just some quick ground rules for everybody in the audience, and as other people join, you can like tap to them or that sort of thing. Um, so obviously, since you guys are in the audience, you guys are kind of free to go about your business. We won't know anything going on. Your mics aren't turned on at all. If you want to like chat, hang out, banter, ask questions, just ask in the, the top right of your screen. There should be a little chat thing there, so you can just chat, um, chat away in there. If you have a question, I'll be looking over it and that sort of thing. Um, uh, let's see. Other than that, we do want to thank our sponsors. We got to do the sponsor show, right? Uh, so thank you so much to Freedom Solar and Ansira uh, Motors for uh, sponsoring the Paragon Pro Squad. Without them, we would not have things like uniforms and races and things like that. So, uh, yeah. So anything I'm missing, Mark? Did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. Cool. All right, well, let's get started. So uh, what we're talking about today is 70.3 Boulder, which is very exciting. Um, just being the guy behind the screen and obviously like far from y'all, like and being remote from y'all, it's really cool looking over the race roster. And I like looked over and I was like, oh my gosh, it's like all the pros, they're like all doing the same race. Cause like up until that point, y'all had all been doing different races. So this was very cool for me to see y'all um, doing this. So. Um, why don't we uh, Why don't we start with something simple? Let's start with what were your um, What were your goals for this race, and uh, how do you just like kind of just your general maybe like even one word to describe how you felt about the race, and then you can kind of riff off of that. So I'll start with uh, Let's start with Becca, ladies first, eh? Well, thank you. Um, okay, so. I am still trying to work on recovering from uh, the hip injury that I had that I got back in October um, and like really just trying to feel confident in the fact that I can run fast again and it's not going to hurt and it's not going to hinder my entire life even outside of triathlon. Um, so yeah, I did I did White Lake um, a couple like a month before Boulder. And was, I, I, for lack of better words, I think I, I kind of gave myself an out for the run and found a different venue and helped a girl that was going to quit and just said, hey, look, let's just finish it together. And she's like, I got to walk some. I said, well, that's okay. Let's just finish it together. And then, like, when I'm done, Mark tells me, you know, that's like your second fastest half ever. And you basically jog walked the second half of that run. And I'm like, oh, man. It really kind of stings, right? Like, that's not... Um, so going into Boulder, I was like, okay, I'm going to run this whole run, and it's going to be great, and I don't care, you know, I'm, I'm not going to look at my watch. I'm just going to run by feel, and I just I just want to run. And so knowing that um, we were up at elevation and that it was going to be a little bit harder to breathe for the swim portion of it, um, you know, Mark was like, you know, just make sure that you really keep your heart rate under control for the swim. Don't let it escalate. Don't try to just go out blazing. And so I did. And I just kind of found a good rhythm for myself and um, came out of the water and, and it felt good. And I was like, all right, let's see what this bike can do. And, and the bike felt amazing. I think I was like 23 miles per hour average. Um, and so that was, that's, it's always a fun course up there on the bike. Um, and then the run came and I was like, okay, this is it. Like, this is where I want to really make sure that I, I'm not going to walk any. I'm not going to let my mind go to those negative places that it can go to and just let the, the anxiety and the, oh, you could just walk just a little bit and then it would be okay. I wasn't going to go there. So it was a big mental game for me. And, um, I, I was like, I think I was like 12 seconds faster in Boulder than I was in 
in White Lake, um, totally different courses. So you can't really like compare apples to apples. Um, but uh, I remember when I got done and I saw Mark and Pablo, the very first thing that I told them was, I ran the whole thing. I, I was, I ran it all. I never walked. And I was so proud of myself for that. So um, looking back on it, I think I was like two minutes or a little bit less than two minutes off of the new PR. And so that's like, that's the drive, right? That's like, yeah. okay, now, now let's go. Like, you know where we need to go. I know that I can run that and not have any pain and, and be able to walk and, and everything afterwards. So let's move on from there. So yes, I'm excited. Um, yeah, it'll be good. I'm excited about what comes next. That's really awesome. I think one of my favorite things is like hearing um, uh, one of my favorite things about like listening to y'all's story about this is that y'all deal with a lot of the same pressures, even at like the highest peaks of performance, right? Um, when you tell me like, oh, like I was really anxious and this was a mental game for me, like and and um, uh, I think, uh, Mark, you have a story about that, I believe in the water. I think that hearing those stories for me just being like this baby in like a sprint triathlon and being like I don't know if I can make it it's like but knowing that people at the highest mm -hmm. levels are experiencing that too I think that's a very um it's, it sounds like oh that's inspiring but I think you know what I mean by that where it's like oh yeah like, it's it's normal it's just part of it um so I should also tell you guys that I I made a big boo-boo I really messed up at the beginning of my race and um and it doesn't, I don't think it matters how many of them you do. Like, there's always going to be something like plan A doesn't work. So you got to be ready for plan B, plan C, whatever that goes. So we were camping. I'm into my motor home currently because we are on our drive home. Um, but we were camping in our motor home over in Golden, which was about a 40-minute drive over to Boulder for the race. So we get up race morning and <laughs> get my children out of bed, even though they didn't want to. And we go over to Boulder for the race. I left all of my nutrition bottles in my refrigerator here in my camper. <laughs> and I didn't even notice it until I get out at Boulder and I'm starting to get my bike out and everything. And I was like, oh. I looked at my husband and I said, I left all my bottles in the refrigerator. And he's like, he, he was like, trying to keep me calm the first thing he's like it's all right just get out of the car i'm gonna go back to the camper and i'm gonna get it and i'm gonna get back and i'm like hold on let's think for a second and i looked in my bag and i had um uh, never second has 90 90 gram packets and that's what i use for my bottle and i had one in my bag with me and so i was like okay all right i i have my hydration bottle already mounted on my bike there's no hydration in it but i have that one I have the packet, so now it's like putting pieces together, and I was like, I gotta find a bottle. I just have to find a bottle. I can put this packet in there, I can get water, and I'll just put water in my front hydration, and I'll grab a Gatorade on the course, and I'm like, all right, I got it, but I gotta find a bottle. And my husband's like, we will go, we will to the Iron Man tent, and I will buy a bottle. If they're not open, I will beg them to let me have a bottle. I, so I was like, okay, I gotta go set up my transition stuff. So I'm going, and uh, Laura Gruden, who's a friend of mine through triathlon, uh, Sam Long's uh, girlfriend, uh, she was there, and I was like, I, she, I saw her first, and she just like gave me a big hug, and I was like, I left all my nutrition at my camper, and I was about to start crying, and, and I said, I have a packet, but I got to find a bottle, and she has a, she has a bottle in her hand, and it's full of water, and she says, take this one, and I was like, oh. What? She goes, yeah, just take this one. Use it. It's fine. I was like, oh, my God, you just saved my race. Thank you so much. You saved my race. So it was a, it was a little bit of hectic and chaos for the beginning of the race, but it all ended up well. <laughs> that's, so that's super awesome. I'm gonna actually, uh, so I'm going to flip over to Mark for a second here because on the subject of, okay, hanging out with Sam Long's girlfriend, I remember, I remember messaging Mark <laughs> about, um, I remember messaging We didn't you, hang like, out at all that weekend. I know. Did you hang out with Sam Long's girlfriend? Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so, uh, I remember messaging you and being like, Hey, um, like I sent you like a video of like Cody Beals because all I do is send vi Mark 
videos of Cody Beals. Or like, I'm like, hey, we should do what Cody Beals this does. Is true. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I think after I sent it to you, you were like, hey, that's really funny. Is he gonna be there this weekend? And so like, yeah. what, what, which was funny to me because I was like, oh shoot, that means like something totally different to him than it does to me. Like, how does yeah, it, yeah. how does it feel? Like, what what did it feel like? You're at the starting line with some of these like really big names and like the i mean i think like you've said before you were like toe-to-toe with them at the very beginning and then things kind of change as the as it goes so so tell me about that yeah i mean it is it is kind of funny especially with social media and people having you know big youtube channels and you can follow them and, and watch their videos and things like that um i think i mean honestly one thing i've sort of learned from my dad who was in the military and often had to like brief, you know, high up generals and things like that is that everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time. Mm-hmm. Still, you know, no one like jumps both feet <laughs> into their pants. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it's a balance of like, it's cool, but and then it's also, I think it's, you know, I'm realistic with my own race expectations in that like, okay, I'm not there to try to beat Sam Long or Lionel Sanders. But at the same time, like, you know, through the due process that USA Triathlon has to earn your license, like, I have the same rights to, like, where I line up at the start to, like, you know, the course. Like, we have the same kind of, like, level in terms of, um, you know, where we are in transition and and things like that. Um, So, yeah, and maybe some of that's just being, like – a little older and having, you know, people and friends and just other things here where like, it's not like I want to be them necessarily. Obviously they're, you know, really fast, um, and phenomenal, phenomenal athletes. Um, and I think also with time, like I said, I have a realistic view of what my level is and my performance. And so I'm not going in comparing my level to them, um necessarily so um yeah it's kind of i mean it's cool yeah Yeah. it is cool yeah it's it's not something that like i still like i mainly just focus on what i need to do to race and and perform for myself yeah pablo go ahead i just want to add something to that because i'm i'm with mark on it and i have two things one i do get starstruck by somebody like taylor need which is who is not my competition she races like you know in the female division and it's like it's so impressive to be honest right like seeing seeing her and, and seeing her level is just or like even not only taylor but many other of the of the female athletes like at, at the top it's like i feel for some reason i don't feel that same with the male athletes like i, don't, I just don't feel it but like i some of the girls i'm like, or like the female sorry i'm like wow like that's it's so impressive. Um, so there's that. But I also think like I, Mark is right. Like with age, you do change the view. Like I remember my first couple of races as a pro, I was, I think like 25 or something like that. And like that ended up putting me in a place where like I started developing a bit of a bad relationship with food because, you know, I was 25 and I was looking at guys that were like completely ripped and I wasn't. And like it really messed with my head. Like that first year as a pro, I like had a, it was just maybe too much to handle and maybe I didn't have the tools psychologically to manage that. And, and, and it did hit me hard. And like with the years, you just realize that, yeah, those people are just athletes. You know, I saw Trevor Foley, uh, basically almost climbing off his bike in one of the first climbs on the course. And he's a guy that has been running one eleven in 70.3. So everybody can have a bad day. Everybody is like, everybody's a human in that start. So just remember that. And you deserve that. I think Mark said it. Like, you earned the right to be there. Uh, Mark, That's go, super yeah. Important. Yeah. go ahead, Mark. Is, no, I, I just have a funny, I have a funny Taylor Nib story because I, I, I resonate with that with Pablo, and I sort of said tongue in cheek before the race, my goal was to not get caught by Taylor Nib, and because uh, she, they started the women started five minutes after us, which is a pretty big gap. And I remember on the bike course, I kept seeing her coach at like different points of the course like he was going back and forth and i so i knew i was like he must be pretty close to me because every time i like go around her coach is standing there with like the whiteboard ready to show her (laughs) and then i was uh starting the run i went through transition and i was starting the run i was running down around the backside, 
and I saw her running into T1 and I was like, or T2. And I was like, Oh no, like, please Mark have a good run. Like, <laughs> and, uh, I did outrun her and then uh, I think she still technically beat me by like 14 seconds in the whole race. Like, um, she, you know, she finished almost exactly five minutes after me, but she got me with, like 14 seconds, which I was a little like, oh, <laughs> I, just wanted, I just wanted to beat all the women, but it's all right. So, but yeah, it was, it was funny seeing her coach over. I was like, she must be really close to me. <laughs> he keeps uh, going back and forth. Hey, so on on that subject, I'm gonna I'm gonna riff off of our notes a little bit here. Uh, sorry, Mark, because um, I, I think that could be a really interesting thing, especially for some of our audience down below. So, um, you know, Pablo was talking about okay, the the change and the pressure that came with going pro, right? And we are obviously here with the pro squad now. Um, uh, do do y'all feel that anything changed for you mentally? Um, when you kind of, when you got that card, when you were like, okay, I am a pro now, what does that mean for me? Was there something that like mentally shifted in both good and bad? Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? And, you know, I mean, there might be people below who are thinking like, Hey, I'd like to go pro. Like, so what can you say about like that process and what that looked like for you in terms of that shift and whoever wants to go first? Okay, maybe I should just um, somebody. I'll I'll go because I was just I was just talking and then let them follow yeah. up. I think for me, um, it is kind of interesting because I did race for a few years in my early twenties, and I think at that time I had a lot of the similar feelings as Pablo, where it like added this level of pressure, um, <clears throat> and almost like I would often be racing more afraid of failing, which I don't even know what that exactly looked like. It was just something I sort of made up. Um, I guess as like what failure was, but it was like often racing being scared to do bad versus excited trying to do well, that kind of thing. Um, and which is ultimately part of the reason I took a break, um, from triathlon as a whole is just, um, because of that, because I was busy in other areas, had just different things going on. Um, but I think this time around, you know, I was able to have a lot of fun just kind of falling in love with triathlon again and the byproduct of enjoying training and racing was kind of got to this point where um you know one felt like it was the next step in continuing to be competitive for myself and there's it's excuse me cheaper in some ways and um just kind of wanted to um to you know take that step up so to speak um to see you know, how I could compete in that world again this year. And I think, um, but because I don't have any specific goals, um, it was really more just like, I like training hard and I like racing hard. And so the the byproduct of that is now being able to do it in this other, but all my goals tend to be super sort of process oriented. Um, you know, I might still be trying to beat people in this specific race, but, I'm not really measuring my performance based off how they do. It's it's purely based on like, do I feel like I got the most out of myself and did I have fun and am I still loving the sport? Yeah, okay, okay. So in some ways it sounds like uh, what it really did for you was it kind of gave you like a new benchmark to be like, okay, this is, this is my benchmark now and I'm going to rise to the occasion in a lot of ways is what that sounds like. Um, Mm -hmm. Becca, how about for you? Can you tell us a little bit about your process of going pro and what that's felt like, what it feels like now? And Mm, this is a very tricky question for me. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I started doing triathlon, like, um, five or six years ago and I I was like, man, I guess that's, you know, I I can kind of compete. Like, this is kind of cool. I, like, I remember my initial goal was, like, I want to go pro. Like, that would be cool. I'm a stay-at-home mom. Like, meh. It'd be fun to, like, be able to say, yeah, I also, I'm a pro triathlete, too. Um, and then and then that happened. And so I think my biggest struggle with it right now is that um, I don't know, like, what's that next, like, carrot for me to go after. Um, in a sense, I think it was easy for me when I was trying to get my card because it was like, 
well, I have to be, you know, I have to beat all the other girls that I'm racing against. Well, I'm sorry, but Mark is an amazing coach, but he's never going to get me to beat Taylor Nip. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Come on, Mark. So that yeah. level of expectation <laughs> has changed. And, um, and, and so it's really hard for me to be in that mental game of it. Um, and I've, I've been pretty open. I struggle with anxiety and depression and I've been open about that on social media. And I recently, you know, I'm trying to get away from medication and trying to, but I've also noticed that that has really affected like my desire to want to train hard and want to race and push myself when, when it's really kind of hard to be like, why? Like, what's the point? Like, yes, you can get a PR. And, and that's what I really have to focus on. Now it's not, like, Mark asked me before Boulder, what's your goals? Like, do you have do you have a goal? Do you have a place goal? And I was like, no, not really, because I can't, I, I can't, um, I have to just focus on me. I can't focus on what anybody else is going to do, but what can I do? So really, it's a time goal for me. It's a PR goal for me. And I really need to wrap my head back around that. Um, so that's kind of where I'm trying to be. I, I think it's really hard to race as a pro when it's it's just like I don't know like I like I told a lady in Salida when I was swimming she was asking me about stuff and I was like oh yeah I race pro and she's like oh you race pro and I'm like well I'm like at the back of the pro field but <laughs> you know but you know I start yeah. I start beside her but yeah. then she just go yeah right, <laughs> um, right so I think it's kind of it's a very tricky situation, yeah. you know, to find yourself in and, and how I think each person kind of handles it differently. I like to have, I like to see it as like, um, almost like creating those friendships with like Laura and, and the other yeah. girls that I know. They're yeah. so amazing. And they're such great people, even like outside of triathlon. Like I like to focus more on like the connections that I can make and the yes. friendships that I can, and like how, I don't know how I can help support them in other ways. So that's kind of what I like to focus on. Although I, I, and also I'm, you know, 37, so I'm much older than some of these young girls. I, you know, maybe have a little bit of life that I can teach them. <laughs> so before I move on to Pablo, real quick, so Zach wanted to ask because I feel like this is very related. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hightail Zach's question to you. Um, what is your athletic background? Because I think that'll help fill out the context as well. Me? Yes. Yes. Um, nothing. <laughs> oh. Well, there you go. Um, is nice. I I swam as a young kid um, on a summer swim team until I was like 13, and then we moved, and I never got back into it. I ran cross country in high school, but I went at a very small school, and I really only did it so I didn't have to be in school as much. So, <laughs> any sport I could do to like get out of class was was my my mo. So. Um, yeah, I really don't have, I have, awesome. I don't have a background with it. <laughs> so yeah. I know, and that's a lot different too. And you know, my husband tries to tell me that too. He's like, you haven't been doing sports. You didn't go to college for sport. You didn't, you know, you haven't had coaching all your life and yeah. like give yourself some grace. So I try to, I try to keep that in my head, but it's hard too when it comes down to it. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. Because I mean, it's like, you know, you've hit this point where it's like, it doesn't matter where you came from. Now you're just here. You know, and now you're just right. at, the, at the baseline yeah. of everybody else. Um, Ivan says mm-hmm. that's awesome, and Zach says that's super impressive. Thanks. Oh, well, um, thank you. And it was after I had two great. kids. I mean, I always have to throw that in there. <laughs> that part is crazy. It's is even more impressive. Like, if you guys saw, <laughs> yeah. like, we have, we have gotten to spend, like, time with, like, Becca in and out, like, you know, at races and stuff like that. And it's like, she, it does super impressive. You know, and I think that should be highlighted. It's like, she's yeah. a mom first. And like, yeah, like, yes, she competes at a very high level. She like, I know many athletes would love to compete at the level she does, but like, she's a mom first, you know, like the day before we were taking pictures and doing like media stuff. And it's like, she's dealing with like the kids who want to do stuff and want to be active. And like Blake was there and helping, but it's like, she's also mom. Like she's there and like, she's taking care of being a mom. And so you're just like, wow, I'm here just trying to take care of myself. I'm struggling with that. <laughs> <laughs> Life is so hard. <laughs> it's too hard. Um, uh, Those kinds of things help, though, too, right? Like in triathlon, right? Like uh, you, multi- you learn how to multitask when you're a parent and you're trying to do other things, too. 
And I think that, you know, definitely that helped me, like, the morning of the race, instead of, like, totally flipping out and just being like, oh, this race is is not going to happen. Like, we just had to figure it out. You just got to work through it. So just different life things. But thank you, guys, because that's that's very special to hear. (laughs) The the chat, uh, Krista says, rocking it, mama. And uh, you're getting lots of three hearts there. So uh, (laughs) chat's loving the mom mom vibe. Um, Before I move on to Pablo and ask you a little bit about your, your pro experience, Pablo, uh, just real quick, uh, for anybody joining us, hello, welcome, thank you for being here. Um, we are interviewing Paragon Pro Squad. We have been talking about Boulder, but now we're just talking about pro life and like what it's like to be. It comes pro. in and out. Um, it comes in and out. <laughs> um, we'll touch we'll into it. Uh, yeah, it, it comes in and out. We'll we'll come back to whatever. Um, and then uh, we do want to thank our sponsors as usual. Thank you to Freedom Solar and and Sierra for. Uh, supporting us uh, we do appreciate them uh, supporting the pro squad so coming right back into it um, Pablo tell us about yeah I mean you've already told us a little bit about the transition to pro tell us tell us how it's been yeah I think I resonate with Mark a lot and that's funny we I think that's a big part of why we have a, a good connection uh, I feel like as an athlete and coach uh, Mark is my coach if, I don't know you know I, he could not be my coach but he's my coach <laughs> Right. And, uh, and I think it's like, I, first of all, I met Mark when he was a pro. Um, so we kind of like, I've seen that progression. I've seen him go back into the age group ranks as well. And I've seen his new step into, in, in fact, we talked a couple of times before he went pro, like mm-hmm. about it, you have, we had conversations about it. And, um, I actually think like in my case, when I became pro, it was kind of like the logical progression I had been racing at a fairly high level as an age trooper um, for, for a good couple of years. And, you know, that was kind of, it, that became a goal at some point. Like I remember I had a couple of good races back when there were a lot of Olympic short distance. Um, like I had a chance to like go under two hours, which was like that mark. And like, I actually went slightly faster than two hours, uh, like way below than two hours. And I was like, okay, like, I think I can do this. And, and in fact, like, you know, I went pro and like my first race, I did Galveston 70.3, forgot of like forgot about like all the times and stuff like that. Never looked at the clock and I ended up going like 10 minutes faster than my fastest time ever in Galveston. And so I do think that like that elevated my level substantially, but that also uncovered a lot of insecurities that I probably had as a person and as an athlete, which are pretty normal when you're 25 and you know, like it's it's fine. Like I think it's like it's nothing wrong to have those insecurities and, and things like that. And it hasn't been an easy journey and I, I would be lying if this was here like roses and, and puppies and rainbows as they say but it hasn't been easy um, in fact like it's been very very challenging from like a mental aspect and a physical aspect um, to the point where you know I, I'm, I'm making like some some strong decisions uh, moving forward but like it's just like the I think being racing as a pro really helped me grow as a as a as, a, as an adult, as a human in many ways, because it really makes you look at, I mean, I feel like when, and, and, and I know this is not the story for a lot of age troopers, but in my case, you know, like I was, you know, getting trophies and medals and jumping on podiums and doing things like that. And like that, like fulfills a lot of gaps and like that makes you feel really good. And it becomes almost like a drug because you like, you like winning. And it's like, uh, when you're a pro, you stop winning. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you stop caring about podium ceremonies, to be honest, in many races. And it's just like, it's hard. And it's it's just like, that's just a little part, but I think it expands to a larger thing in life where it's like, you really have to find your whys and you really have to mm-hmm. perhaps look at, like, do that growth that Mark did outside. And it's like, okay, if at mm-hmm. the end of that growth and at the end of that kind of uh, introspection, you realize that what your why is and like you still want to continue be racing as a pro like that's fine but it's also fine if you don't and i think mm-hmm. it's just my advice to that 25 year old or to any person that wants to go pro um is just make sure that your why's are very clear because you're gonna jump and they're gonna be lions like it's going to be ruthless like i'm not i'm not here like sounding like it's no it, it is like people are racing and Mark and I have talked about this a lot. And it's like, we forget that many of the guys that are at the top 10, top 20, this is their livelihood. Like a lot of those guys mm-hmm. are racing to get food and put food on their table. And we mm-hmm. are lucky that 
and we might be lucky that that's not our case, you know, like mm -hmm. regardless. And it's like that changes a lot of things and that makes everything look very different. It's not bad. It's not good. I don't like to think that it's, it's better than racing as an age grouper, but it's different and you have to realize that. <laughs> and so I think like going back to when I made the decision, like, sure, I wish I had known better, but I also think it helped me grow a lot as an athlete in many ways. It definitely pushed me um, to compete at a higher, le higher level. And like, if we go into times, you know, like your average times become times that you were, you will dream of, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's something also that we like to keep perspective on. And it's like, sometimes people come and say like, oh, you had an awesome race. And it's like, you know, I did a 422 in Boulder or something like that. And like, I know like that's almost 20 minutes slower than my best 70.3 is for me. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, and like, I think this is probably, that's going to sound hard for a lot of people. It's like, if you put it in times, like that's a bit of a failure, right? Like that's far from like my best time. But I also recognize that many people will dream to do that. And like, that may seem very impressive for many of them. And like, mm -hmm. I appreciate that as well uh, because Otherwise, you can just take it for granted. It's very easy to take all of this for granted. Mm -hmm. Man, so, that's some sagely yeah. wisdom. I love it. Well said. Some good life advice. <laughs> awesome. We're, cl we're, we're clipping those clips. <laughs> wow. I'll use those for Instagram tomorrow. Um, no, on, on that subject, so actually that actually pivots really well. Pablo, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, because so my understanding from Mark, I didn't, I didn't know this. Um, you probably yeah. had the largest elevation change out of everyone with boulder actually i actually i i was actually the one supposed to have the less impact oh, the least impact. oh okay yeah, just kidding so... i had that wrong pablo come on, man. No. so yeah so tell me about that tell me about about that well we'll weave it back to boulder now yeah i was i was drowning in all the oxygen in fact because uh, <laughs> so i live i live at like eight thousand nine thousand feet okay. i i I'm, i have a hard time with feet uh, i live at 2600 meters so that's a thousand meters higher than uh, than Boulder. Um, so for me, it was like really coming down and, and I felt really good. Like the, the day before the two days before, like I will look at my heart rate while running and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but that's how things happen. You know, like I was sick 10 days before the race. We don't know what the sickness was like to have been COVID or a cold or something. And, it looks like the effort in the swim, perhaps because it was at elevation, uh, irritated my lungs uh, to the point that like I couldn't breathe. Like they got really painful and like I, my chest just closed up. Uh, not like in an anxiety, you know, like when I know a lot of people have like panic attacks in the water, in cold water. I've had them before and that usually happens at the start. Um, this happened, you know, 1200 meters into the swim which was the un unusual part. And like, that was the part where the doctors at the race, after the race, uh, mm -hmm. kind of like looked at me and they said like, yeah, you probably like, there was something going on in your lungs that just, you know, showed up during the race. Um, and I, that was kind of, I was like, oh no, like this was supposed to be my best swim because I was, you know, like at a lower elevation. And in fact, mm -hmm. like, I was actually feeling good in the swim, like when we started and stuff like that, because I had plenty of oxygen. So elevation wasn't an issue for me, to be honest. Um, and it felt really, really good the days before. Um, so yeah, I think the, I, I think Mark and, and, and Becca were a little bit more, I'm not going to say worried, but you know, they, they definitely had like a specific strategy for the swim to start a little bit more conservative. And I know like Mark and I talked about this before the race, and he's like, you can actually go hard. Like, you should be comfortable going hard. And like, that's what I did because I knew I, I had the ability yeah. to do it. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. factually you felt like, Hey, this is how this should go. But then like results wise, heart rights, feeling wise, like once you're in. And it, it, and it really did. It, it, like, I think like the first half of the swim, like I felt really good oxygen wise. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just the point it started just getting more and more irritated because I was going hard. Um, mm -hmm. It just became really uncomfortable to breathe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who Who wants to go next? Let's uh, Let's Let's pivot. We'll go in reverse order. We'll I'll go back to Becca now. Um, Becca, tell us about like the elevation change for you and what that felt like, and uh, maybe some of the things you had to do to deal with that. So uh, we drove. So like I said, we're in a motorhome. Um, so we drove up and we. We left on Wednesday and drove to Kansas, and then on Thursday we drove the rest of the way. 
So we kind of got there. They say, and you guys can correct me if I get it wrong, but I think it's like like two to three days before or a week before to like try to get the elevation and longer um, or like two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like two. Sorry, like two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like we got there really close to the race. I got there. I got up there on you know Thursday afternoon. The race was on Saturday. So I I went for a run and yeah I was sucking some wind and that heart rate was quite a bit. Um, but then I think I think my body adjusted pretty well. Um, you know on the swim. Well, if you'll notice from the Instagram videos that got posted right after, I laughed so hard at it um, because it was an amazing video that got posted. But when it showed me in the water, and I was like, oh, and then I start because uh, the, yeah. was, we had a cannon. We had a cannon, but the guys did not. <laughs> and yeah, like, so oh. the guys had it. I was like, oh, crap. Okay, yeah, there it is. I was not ready for it, and they didn't tell us that we were going to. So I think it was kind of like, I was in a little bit of like, oh, okay, wait, like hold on, slow back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, you know, I wasn't, I, I just was like, okay, just stay on some feet and just try to like really, you know, control your heart rate in the swim. Um, and yeah, just, just keeping, keeping my breathing steady, um, not kicking quite as hard as I, I normally do because that like gets your heart rate up. And so just really trying to focus on staying on some feet and and I felt good this one felt felt really pretty good um I think it's I think as good as it could feel at that elevation cool okay I mean that's that's good you know outside of a cannon like jolting your start <laughs> I know it is hilarious and if you guys haven't noticed it go back and look at it because I'm like I'm ready I'm ready <gasps> Okay, go. It's, it was pretty so great. Funny. I was like, "Oh, she was like really surprised by it." Yeah, I was like, it, "It's the it's the teeth clenching that I remembered." So, um, I'm gonna pivot this over to you, Mark. Um, if, if you want to talk real quick about altitude, and then after that, we're gonna get, jump right into the Q and A here. Um, yeah, I, I really, I've raced really well at altitude over the years. I don't know why. When I was in high school, junior nationals was there a couple times, and I've had I have my best ever finish. I distinctly remember a turkey trot I ran in Denver one day, one year that I flew in the morning of, and it was like top five, like best races I've ever had. Um, so I don't know why that is exactly. I mean, definitely training in the heat helps. It hasn't been too hot here. Um, I think I, I've always found too, just if you do enough aerobic training and you're aerobically fit, that also helps. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I mean, I pushed my highest power ever in a 70.3. My run was good. The swim, I did have a bit of an issue. I, I just took a caffeinated gel that got my heart rate a little higher, and that was just uh, silly. I just didn't think about it, honestly. Uh, and I had thought about it last year because I actually swam slower than I did at Boulder last year, um, oddly enough. But um, other than that, I – I uh, Boulder, I mean, Boulder's not crazy high. It's like 5,200 feet or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I think as long as you're – and I almost feel like it's a little less too for a race that's so long like a half Ironman as long as you're careful with that start because you're pretty far below threshold the whole time. You know, you're really not up at, up at your threshold. Um, so, yeah, I didn't have any – real issues other than just like a bit of a mistake I made, but that wasn't, that wasn't huge. Yeah. Pablo, go ahead. I, I just want to add some, like reinforce what Mark said. And I think this is a good advice and it, we are not really talking about fully training, but like, I think people get too caught up sometimes trying to, you know, like acclimate in a way. And like, we know like heat acclimation or like altitude will be like a way, a way to acclimate, yeah, like if yeah, you go 10 right. days before and stuff like that. But I think sometimes we forget the stress that that can bring to somebody. Like, I don't know, mm. if you go like 10 days before, you're probably going to be away from home in an environment that is like not normal, like maybe away from family. And it's like, don't forget, like just being aerobically fit and just being being really fit can like <laughs> actually help. Like, it's just like, mm -hmm. just like being fit is so basic, but like mm -hmm. it can really take care of like acclimation, like, I don't know, I, I've made a mistake as an athlete or like trying to like fit in so many sauna sessions to be like super acclimated into the heat mm -hmm. because like I live in like a colder place and it's like, 
no, you end up being just more tired. It's just like, make sure you just, you're just feet, you know, like if you're feet, yeah. you can do a lot of things very impressively. So, uh, yeah, good point, Mark. That's cool. I like that advice. Like, just go back to basics, just your foundation. Just like, get real just fit. Crazy. Yeah, just get real fit, <laughs> obviously. So... It's the line. The line is my line. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, okay, so um, with the last couple of minutes that we have, and we have like a couple of minutes left, but we don't want to go too long. It is a, it's still a weeknight. It's it's Friday's Friday, if you will, right? Um, thanks again for to everyone for joining us. Uh, let me go, let me uh, kind of walk you guys through the preamble. If you still got any questions, we're still gonna go. We've we've still got uh, the Q and A left, so um, we'll get to the question here. But uh, if you do have a question, write it down in the little chat box to your right. Otherwise, you can also raise your hand, and we can bring you up to speak, but it's just that we might not quite get to everyone that way, and we'll probably get to more questions faster if we do the chat. Um, so we've got already three questions in queue. The first one is going to be from our, uh, from the uh, survey that we took, and the question was, what tires do you all race on? If you can please include details like width, tubeless versus tubes, and PSI. Thanks. Top secret. Oh. I just can't. <laughs> secret formulas. Oh, I think I should be racing on Paolo's tires. Uh, GT5 well, go ahead, go ahead Pablo. Yeah, so I think feel like Mark and I were big geeks on stuff like these. And like he has tested some stuff, which I've kind of like seen him test it. And it's fine. Uh, and I keep going back to the Continental GP 5000s with latex tubes. Um, I have to use tubes because I don't have tubeless. So, uh, you know, I like latex. I have been using latex tubes for a long time for racing. So, uh, and I think like the Continental 5000s, yes. Like if you look at some of the studies, there might not be the fastest tire in the market, but they do have a little bit of like flat protection and it's like, well, two watts, three watts different maybe, and like versus like being on the side of the road. And like, you have to realize like, we don't race in like super clean roads all the time. Like, I mean, the course in Boulder is kind of rough in some spots where if you are in a very thin um, tire, like you could just have a flat. And so I like the flat protection from the GP 5000s and the latex tubes. And I ran a fairly low, I think I ran just like 70 PSI, I want to say. I don't why I remember, but I want to say it was like 70. Uh, Mark will correct me. I think we discussed it a couple times. Uh, I think yeah. that's right. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was writing right now. I'm probably going to change this, but for Boulder, I had, I switched to tubeless at the end of last year. Um, so the last couple years I was running the Michelin power TT tires with latex tubes. One thing it's always good to note is I have, 25 i'll buy 25 millimeter tires but they actually blow up to like 27 28 millimeters mounted on my rims just they're a little wider other rims they'll measure narrower so i um adjust the tire pressure for that and then this year i'm i switched to tubeless for the benefit of like if i get a little something a little tack maybe it'll seal in the race and i'm running the schwalbe pro one tt uh at like low 60 psi but boulder the roads were pretty good so i think i wrote them a little higher like 64 65 i'm not convinced the guys from flow cycling actually said that those tires aren't super aero and i the bike course i think is a lot faster than the course i raced last fall and i pushed like 15 watts higher and I only rode two minutes faster. And I really feel like to be on a faster course with 15 more watts, I should have been a little faster. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's different is my tires. Um, Cause I rode the power TTs last year. So I'm debating what to do for the next race, whether to switch to the Thank Vittoria you to the Vittoria Corsa Speed, whatever they are, Veloflex record some things, or maybe go back to Latex. Um, I'm not sure, but that's what I, I rode this year. Schwalbe Pro 1 TTs, tubeless with mid-60 PSI. Carlos Vela said uh, he's not a fan of Pro 1. <laughs> validating me. Mm, yeah. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. look cool. They look cool, though. The tan sidewalls, they yeah. look stick. That's but it. I'm just like, man, I don't feel like 
don't know. Aesthetic is the end game, baby. That's the that's the end game. Aesthetic. Um, yeah. Uh, it looks fast. Game. It goes fast. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, no, that no, 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 sure don't take that. Don't, that's that's don't. the clip we're actually gonna put on Instagram tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Becca, Becca, what uh, the tires did you race on? I'm on the Pablo train here. <laughs> I did GP Park Alpins with uh, latex tubes, and mine were um, right at eighty, maybe maybe seventy eight, seventy nine psi. Okay, cool. Um, Let's move on to the uh, next question. So the next one, okay, we're gonna go ahead and go to the hot button one that we talked about before the show. We'll do that one, uh, and then after that, we'll move into the the actual cool, like the proper ones and the rest of it. Uh, so the hot button. I have question, some research ready. Oh man, that's how you know. Uh, the hot button question was asked by Pablo Bueno, and it is. Hang on, I gotta move. He's not down. here. And he's, he's not, not here to hear the. He's answer. not, he's even not here. here. Um. In light of Sam Appleton's penalty and the videos we've now seen of Sam Long crossing the yellow lines, what do you think should have been done during the race? I think the race organizers need to do something about the course for next year's event, but once you start the race, you agree to play by the rules, and Sam Long should have been DQ'd. It would have been harsh and unwarranted, but them's the rules. Mm -hmm. So what do y'all think of that? DQ all the way. DQ all the way. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> they were super clear in the pro meeting. They told us. If you cross the yeah. if you cross the middle line, you get the queue. There were other pros as competitive as Sam, like Sam Appleton, that he actually decided not to cross the line and got a drafting penalty, five minute drafting penalty. You know, he chose the less of two evils, and uh, that's the rules. And like Sam crossed them, knowing what the rules were, and nothing happened. And I I'm sorry, but like I like Sam, I think he's pretty impressive. I just they maybe play a little favorites there, uh, and and that's the reality. And yes, I think, look, the organizers do a great job with the course, and we talked about this. I think Mark and I had a conversation about this. They do the best they can. It's actually a fairly safe course. From all the courses that we do, this is one of the safest courses. It was a section of the road that is very narrow, where you're going down, you're going down, you're going fast, you're going downhill. That's a reality of the sport we are in. We are professional triathletes competing in a mass start sport where the courses are as good as they can get. Um, you know, this is no PTO. This is not a PTO event where there are only pros in the course. It's the reality, and we have to accommodate to that. They try to do a great job. Um, I do believe, like, I, I actually, they had a good talk to us about <laughs> motorcycles as well because that's an issue, and they were very clear about that. They are trying their best. And, look, I'm personally not a super fan of Ironman, um, as pros, you know, like they could do certain things better, yes, but in this case, they do as good of a job as they can with the course, and some should have gone disqualified. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I actually I pulled up the uh, I pulled up the they did say they definitely said in the meeting like, well, I don't know, I felt like they weren't a hundred percent clear in the meeting to be honest. Um, and the rules do, that I pulled up do say, you know, a cyclist should not cross the yellow line. Um, 30, and then it says 30 or 6, unless directed by a race referee or race official with actual authority, which is kind of an interesting thing to put in there. Um, and then a 30 or 60 second time penalty as applicable or depending on severity of violation, disqualification. I think part of the problem is, yeah, they just maybe we're not as clear – as they could have been and but i i definitely agree with pablo like i mean if you do any usa cycling event i mean the center line rule is a hard rule like if you cross the center line that that's it because it, the theory is it's basically like a wall right like that is the edge of the road is that yellow line um so yeah i mean they should if that's going to be the rule they should enforce it or you know I, yeah, I think that's the safest rule to have. You have to, um, or maybe but it, no it is zone. hard. Maybe you yeah. make an opposite zone and like everybody's neutralized in that section and it sucks, but you know, like that's maybe that's the way. At least the, the yeah. hard downhill part is a no passing zone, like it happens in like Oceanside. Um, yeah, at the military base, yeah, you know, like that could be, yeah, a I mean, I pollution. I think it was a pretty safe course overall because it was loops, so there was no out and back section. 
So there's no out and back where you have cyclists going both ways plus like cones or a center line in that sense. But um, yeah, I mean, there's still just a lot of people on the course when we're on our second lap and then there's a lot of age groupers starting their first lap and there's a lot of people that aren't that aware. I mean, I definitely rode on the center line once or twice. Um, I didn't cross over, but you know, I mean, it's as simple as someone's taking a gel and they boom, swing all the way to the left because they can't ride with one hand. And if you're going 40 miles an hour down the hill and your and your bar is like, all of a sudden you're going to swerve out of the way to not smash into them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would agree they need to have a hard rule and they need to then enforce it across the board. Becca, anything you want to add to that at all? To to dogpile yeah. onto the situation? <laughs> she just found out about this situation. Today. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to have an opinion. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to have it yet. You can refrain. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it's a, I, I might just say um, I've been in Yellowstone and without service for like the past two weeks since the race. Probably better for case, people. and so I didn't know That's anything about it here. until we just started yeah. <laughs> this. They, they, they're like, well, "What about this situation?" I'm like, "What are you talking about? Like, I have no idea. I haven't even. I've lived in a peaceful, wonderful, except for you know maybe a little bit of kid fighting world uh, for a little while. So it's been good. Um, I I think like thinking back at it, I'm you're always going to have issues in races. I mean, people we're humans, right? Like the officials are human. I mean, everything's it's you're always going to have have issues with something and and nobody's ever going to be like not everybody's always going to be happy like there's always going to be somebody that gets caught for something and they're going to think that they weren't doing it and then or or somebody that doesn't get caught for something so i mean i think it's part of the sport in itself right like it's not there's not video cameras on every single person the entire race like it is what it is in a sense like if you get caught then you get caught and you got to pay the penalty if you don't get caught, then you say your prayers and thank God that you didn't get caught, and you try not to do that again. But that's right. just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Said like a real Zen master who just emerged from the woods, and like you know, <laughs> and or a mom, you know, who understands like the process of kids getting caught doing stuff. Um, uh, okay, I am going to move on to uh, our more our other wholesome questions. Um, okay, Ali is asking, did you make any different decisions for the run, considering that most of it was on dirt? Or would you have done anything differently? We don't normally have dirt or gravel on 70.3 courses. Oh, Can I God. say first? Yeah, 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 please. <laughs> okay, this is really funny, because the day before, like, we did the practice swim, and then we were talking about the run course, and I looked at Mark, and I was like, should I have brought different shoes? Like, <laughs> I didn't even, like... I hadn't even like registered in my head um and so i mean i i use my my normal shoes but yes it was i did notice that like especially around my ankles um the next couple of days they were really sore um and i think it was just like such off off camber kind of running that um it just it adjusted some of the ways that my my ankle bones muscles not bones, muscles were were moving um and it was also very hot because there wasn't a lot of shade so What, um, I mean, what, what do you think you would have done differently now in hindsight? Because that's, I think that's a very interesting question. Or would I you think I would have talked to my coach about a <laughs> different shoe possibility or, or like if there was something, something that we should have done. I mean, um, you know, he did, he did talk to me about like trying to make sure that, um, taking the, the shortest angle uh, around any of the corners, around any of, you know, staying on the road, um, I, I ran more towards the middle where it was a flatter surface, um, mm -hmm. trying to not be on the the edges um, as much. But and I think I think definitely like the second loop, I was a lot more aware, right? So like maybe if I would have had a little bit more time to kind of go and peruse that portion, like that that back portion, like I think is like the last five k is kind of what sticks in my head. Um, that might have been, it might have prepared me a little bit better for. Okay, yeah. Uh, anybody else want to chime in on that one before we get to like the last one or two questions here? 
Okay. Um, so I've got one question here that I think I'd want to hear from each of you. And then I think after that, we've got time for one more. So if anybody's got one more question, feel free to pop it into the, the chat. And I'll probably take the easiest one, to be honest, um, uh, as we kind of wrap up here. Which, before we wrap up, let me just say thanks for everybody for showing up. It's been a great time talking about this. So uh, this is a great uh, question to wrap it up, uh, or to almost wrap it up. Uh, what tips do you have for athletes wanting to race Boulder for the first time? Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with Pablo. Mm. What what tips? Uh, hmm. 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 I think it's, it depends how what what you want to get out of the of the race, right? Like if you are trying to complete a seventy point three, maybe not thinking about like any specific performances and stuff like that. Um, I think it's a it's a great course to do it. I think if you are Choosing to perform, maybe give yourself a chance to experience. If you are not super exposed to altitude, like we know, it doesn't affect Mark, and it doesn't affect like it. Maybe maybe Rebecca didn't have much of a, of an effect in in the altitude front. Like if you're gonna go there and you're gonna try to go for like a world spot, or you wanna put him in your age group or something like that, like maybe explore before. Like maybe even give yourself like a little training camp if you can maybe a year before um something like that where you can go experience kind of almost test how you feel so you can make adjustments if necessary um for for race week and and, and look i was the one talking about not needing to uh do more acclimation and stuff like that but you also you know like if you're gonna do something and you want to get something out of that just maybe maybe take some steps before and, and don't be surprised uh, because I know that can throw a lot of people off. And then the other, is, it will be just like, e- enjoy the experience, really. I think it's like, we hear so much about Boulder. That was my first 70.3 uh, 12 years ago. And for me, it was like going to the Mecca of triathlon because I've heard so much about Boulder. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be like, for for people that are fans, like I at that time, and like I'm still a fan right now, but like, I was an 18 year old kid that was like a super fun in the sport back when there was no social media, like no Instagram, but like there were like triathlete magazine with pictures of like all these people in Boulder. And I got to see them in person. Like that was huge. And that's a super cool experience that you only get there because they live there. And like, that's like for them is normal <laughs> beyond the course. Yeah. Like we saw a guy that runs for like on running, just, you know, doing one of his easy runs like the mm-hmm. day before. And it's like, this is a guy that is trading with Joe Klecker. And you're just like, wow, you could see Joe Klecker. Like, if he was around, he would probably yeah. be running around. <clears throat> so that's super cool. Enjoy the experience. Cool. Uh, let me go to yeah. – I'll go to – actually, I'll go to Becca, and then I'll go to Mark. I'll let Mark have the uh, the closing thought on that one. <laughs> um, I think that uh, – I think Boulder was uh, a great choice, and, and it's a great choice for anybody um, because of the the surrounding, the area that you're so beautiful. Like, you know, even when your mind wants to go to the negative places, like you just look around and you're like, oh my gosh, like how awesome is it that I get to be here amongst all these other people that are suffering just like I am, but in such a beautiful place. And that's that was. I think today, like, or not today, this race, this year, because I've done Boulder before. I did it um, the first year I was a pro. But I think this year's race, you know, that's where I really let my mind kind of focus on more of look at this amazing opportunity that I got to do this in this beautiful country that got created. Like, that's just awesome. So for me, you know, I think I would tell you, like, just really remember enjoying the atmosphere that you're in. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, and uh, Mark, I don't think we have any other questions, so why don't you take this home and, and tell us uh, your uh, tips for athletes who okay. want to race Boulder for the first time. Well, um, this sort of honestly ties in with Allie's question a bit um, because I think it's really – I think we all have a tendency to want to kind of get obsessed with the specifics of a race. Right. And like Pablo and I were kind of talking about, he was mentioning that before. And, um, you know, so like with Ali's question about the, the shoes, it's like, it's definitely worth something, um, 
to maybe consider, but I wouldn't say it really impacted that much. You know, I'm, I'm not running the same pace as Lionel Sanders because I didn't like prepare for Boulder specifically enough or wear the right shoes. It's just like Lionel's a better athlete. (laughs) He's just faster. So kind of back to what we were saying at the beginning too, of like, if you're, you know, looking at Boulder's your first 70.3, there's many aspects. It's like, it's a, it's a 70.3. The swim is this distance. The bike is this distance. The run is this distance. Um, I, that being said, you know, the definitely the one thing with altitude is, don't show up six days out or five days out. Um, that if you don't live at altitude, that w- will probably hurt your performance. And and while I've like raced at altitude really well quite a few times, I usually show up kind of like last minute ish. Hmm. Um, and so we had an athlete last year race Boulder with us, and um, he got there like on Monday for the Saturday race, and he felt. It was his first time, I think, ever being at altitude as well, and, and he felt pretty crummy on race day. Um, you know, probably just like a little bit altitude sickness, just wasn't wasn't um, ready for it. And part of that's just like the timing kind of. So I do think that is the the most important thing. A lot of people might look like, oh, I want to go on a vacation with family and come up a week before. It's like, don't do that do the vacation after or come up two weeks before, you know, I kind of look at it as like 10 days. If you can't get up there at least 10 days out, get up there on, um, you know, and and driving from Texas, I'll do like a two day thing where I'll, I'll, um, you know, stay in Lubbock or Amarillo or something and then kind of finish the last bit and show up now with 48 hours before the race starts kind of thing. So that's, I would say that's the only special consideration for that race. And, Again, like I think whenever you're looking at picking a race, um, you know, don't get too caught up in specificity that you forget to just train well and and get fit. Because the reality is, you know, us and the other pros we we race, like we're going to race a lot of different courses and a lot of different terrain and didn't necessarily. I mean, the one thing I did when I was in Tulsa with with Ali's race and. I was doing a run workout and there was like this little piece of gravel next to the path. I was like, well, maybe I should do it on the gravel. Cause like Boulder's got some gravel, <laughs> but that was like the extent of my specificity for, for running on gravel. It was like, Oh, here's some gravel here. Let me see how that feels. Um, so it wasn't like planned for sure. So, but um, yeah, just focus on, you know, the holistic training of, you know, building your threshold, building your VO2, building your aerobic fitness, like all of those things. Are, they're going to allow you to bike up hills fast. They're going to allow you to race at altitude well. They're going to allow you to, you know, run without having to walk. Like all of those boxes get ticked when you just kind of train well uh, and aren't really dependent on whether, like, you know, the the bike has small hills or big hills or long hills. Because ultimately, most of us don't have the luxury of going to a training camp for three months to to prep in the specific area and things like that. So, um, but yeah, the definitely like showing up to altitude last minute. Um, still giving yourself time to check in and make sure bike issues and things are okay. But that's, that's definitely don't show up five days out. That's kind of the main thing. Probably got time for your parting shot. You look like you, you had something you were going to say there. Mark, Mark reminded me of something. I think hydration, just hydrating enough in Boulder is kind of important. I do. It, it's a weird it's it's a weird environment, uh, biosphere. Some Ali <laughs> will correct me, <laughs> where it's like uh, it's just like it feels dry, and you do feel yeah. like you feel like you have to consume a lot of liquids, and I don't know why, uh, but it does feel like it's. I don't know if it's like there is like a desert kind of thing. It doesn't feel like St. George dry, but it does. Yeah, it's like a weird dryness where. Um, it does require you to like hydrate um, a little bit more. You get thirsty very easily there. So mm-hmm. um, even for me going down in altitude, like usually when you go up in altitude, you, you do have to hydrate more. But even for me, like going down in altitude, it was a factor. So I, I wonder if it's like some something mm-hmm. in the environment there specific uh, where, yeah, it just feels weirdly dry. Um, mm-hmm. That might be like a specific... Um, advice for these races. Yeah, Sorry. no, that's, yeah, that's, that's totally true. true. That's, that's good. Really yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Well, uh, guys, 
This has been awesome. We finished we finished right on time basically. Well done. Look at you guys. Paragon Pro finishing on time. Um uh, thank you all for being here. Thank, uh, thank you, Paragon Pro Squad, for being here. And thanks for an awesome show. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope everybody in the audience did as well. Um, audience, thank you all for being here. Y'all are champs and y'all are troopers. I'm so glad that we had a really... This is a really great audience for our first uh, Discord stage channel. Stage channel. Um, show. And uh, yeah, again, before we exit, uh, of course, we want to thank our sponsors. Thank you again to Freedom Solar and for, uh, to Ansira for everything that they're doing and supporting the Pro Squad. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Team Paragon, for just being awesome. And uh, One so highlight of my trip. Yeah. Highlight of my trip, which was thanks to the Paragon Squad. Like really, thanks to the Paragon Squad, I was able to do that trip. And my, the highlight of my trip was going back to San Antonio with Mark, seeing a lot of the people that are here in the, in the chat and like spending time with them. Yeah. Um, I got to get, you know, have my my yearly treatment with Dale, which I love and like highly recommend. <laughs> and so I think he I gotta just keep the showed up. There. I think he literally just showed the up. Dale, the Dale uh, he's there. I can see him there. Oh, I can okay, see him yeah. there. So that was the highlight of my trip. Um, so I, I really love the community <laughs> that you guys have there. So it's, it's super cool. Cool. Well, yeah. Um, for what it's worth, read the chat box when you leave uh, speakers because everybody is feeling very inspired. So uh, well done. Yep. And uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good show, and uh, we'll see you next time.